what I wanted to do today was introduce a few examples of where we've used 3D characterization for um, corrosion and uh, coatings, and just to illustrate how it can be a very powerful way of understanding the mechanisms taking place and uh, lots of other aspects of uh, observations that we can make in 2D from the surface and other things like that. Because I've got several examples, uh, there's a large group of people at Manchester and uh, beyond uh, that have uh, contributed to this work uh, and they're all listed here. So it's clear that a lot of the time there's information that we know we need to understand and this covers a huge range of length scales so we can actually see that we want to understand why a component is failing and that might be at the meter or centimeter scale but we know that the mechanisms controlling that behavior are all taking place at the nano scale so how do we connect that understanding of failure with the processes taking place at a much smaller scale and illustrated here is some of the 3D imaging um, and, uh, and machining techniques that we can use to actually cover a range of scales to look at those uh, processes and, and that degradation, as well as some of the other analytical techniques, such as adding the chemistry and crystallography. And I've illustrated mechanical testing, but this could be any sort of testing. And again, there's different techniques that are appropriate for the different scales. But if we want to connect that understanding of failure of a component to the processes at the nanoscale, we need to actually use a number of these different machining techs, techniques to actually prepare the samples that we need uh, to understand and link together these different scales to put that all in context. I'm gonna give a brief introduction of how X-ray CT works and then how FIB serial sectioning works uh, and then go on to the examples. So for those of you that are not familiar, in the lab we have a point source of X-rays and that point source of X-rays creates a cone beam of X-rays. And these X-rays illuminate the sample and are recorded on the, the, uh, the intensity is recorded onto a detector. Now, in a normal X-ray CT image, very similar to if you were to get an X-ray of your arm or leg in a hospital, we basically map the density of that material. So cracks, pores will be very low density compared to say solid metal, which would be high density. But once we've recorded that image, we then rotate the sample between 180 and 360 degrees and take an image at all of those different angles. But to actually get what we want, which is a 3D replica image of virtual volume, we have to reconstruct that data. And that's turning these transmission radiographs into a series of slices, which are now in, in real space. And it's from that reconstructed virtual volume that we can actually make this a vi visualization and analysis of that 3D, uh, 3D image. One of the things that I think is most impressive and most useful about x-ray imaging is the fact that it's completely non-destructive and it's completely non-contact. So our x-ray source is somewhere off to the side here and the detector is way over here and this is an example of a radioactive graphite sample so it's in a container to contain that uh, radiation but then it's being compressed and it's also being heated to 600 degrees with these infrared lamps. So we're creating this incredibly intense environment and at the same time the x-rays are coming through and watching everything that's happening there so we can create very realistic and very pertinent uh, environments but at the other end of the scale we've got here you can actually image a seedling of a plant growing and we can actually maintain that temperature and humidity needed to actually uh, watch that uh, grow continuously so very powerful for creating a relevant environment and then watching what happens also, more and more, although I won't talk about it too much today, uh, but I wanted to highlight the fact that we're now starting to add a lot more information to that absorption contrast. We can add energy sensitivity, which means we can actually look at the elemental composition with X-rays in 3D non-destructively. And the same, we can actually create, uh, collect an absorption image. We can also co collect X-ray diffraction data and again, recreate a 3D visualization of that crystallography of the sample. Now, a quick introduction to FIBSEM serial sectioning. The most common way that we use this technique is very similar to a loaf of bread. 
And this is a block of material, which is the loaf. And actually, it's the front of that loaf of bread that we will image and record that image with the SEM. That could include EBSD or EDX. And then we slice that front of that block away. So now this is actually an example in the gallium fib where we've created a block here of uh, stainless steel and then image this front block face and then slice away a, a, a slice of material, which would be at the nano uh, scale. That slice could be 100 nanometers or 50 nanometers or less. Very good resolution, very good contrast of the microstructure, but it is a destructive technique. So there's no, no uh, recovering the sample after you've carried out this. The technique that most of you will be familiar with is uh, using a gallium ion source, um, and that provides very high resolution but limited volumes. So you can actually get down to a slice of, say, five nanometers even here, but the total volume of material that's practical to remove in serial sectioning with a gallium fib would be of the order of like uh, 40 to 50 microns uh, cubed. I will show an example uh, later of using the femtosecond laser which is one of our latest pieces of equipment here at Manchester. And now we have three beams, all coincident in the microscope of the electron beam for characterization, a plasma uh, xenon ion beam, and then also a femtosecond laser. And the femtosecond laser now is capable of removing much larger volumes of material compared to the, the FIB although you do lose some finesse. So actually the smallest slice that we can do in the uh, laser is about 200 nanometers, but actually you can go up to a volume of a one millimeter cubed uh, with this uh, uh, setup. I just wanted to highlight how all of these different serial sectioning techniques are all combined with the SEM. So you've got all of the accessibility of those different modes, uh, analytical modes that you can take advantage of. But here, in this paper listed ultramicrotomy, gallium fib, xenon plasma fib, argon broad iron beam, femtosecond laser, and oxygen plasma fib. And so obviously different techniques are appropriate for different materials, but actually most fibs um, and the laser is appropriate for a lot of metal systems. And actually the femtosecond laser and the oxygen fib seem very good for organic materials uh, as well. And this is just an example of how we can build up from one slice we can actually take a SEM image, we can take an EBSD map and an EDX map, and we've got all of these layers of information for each slice. So I'll move on to my first example. So in this example, I uh, work with uh, Dirk uh, Engelberg and uh, our PhD student uh, Kenichiro Iguchi with uh, JFE Steel. We were looking at the in-situ pitting of a lean uh, duplex stainless steel. And created this electrochemical in situ cell and you can see it's shrunk down to just uh, like three centimeters uh, across um, so we can actually polarize the sample in an in a in a hydrochloric uh, uh, environment and monitor the polarization of these uh, samples which is the, a wire of this duplex stainless steel and monitor the current and what we've got is we've got two different materials here. We've got a as received uh, wire and then one that we've heat treated. And the only difference between these is the grain size. So the average grain size going up from um, uh, one micron to 10 microns when we did the heat treatment. And that made it much easier for us to actually understand and look at the microstructure after after the corrosion. And this is where it all fits in. So this is this is an example of inside one of our uh, X-ray CT scanners. And here we've got the X-ray source. Here we've got a bank of different detectors. And here's the sample. It's not, not the exact same sample that I just showed with the electrochemical cell. But you can see you actually get the source and the detector very close to get those high resolution 3D images. And then this is all rotated um, to get that 3D image of the sample. So we have to set that up, but we've got a, a, a potential stat in there to actually drive the corrosion processes. And in this case, we're doing a polarization and then an image and a polarization and an image. And after this uh, sequence of um, uh, um, steps, we create a number of pits across the sample. And hopefully you can see that we've got 
like four pits here and three pits here. This is just showing the different sides of the external surface. So this is the 3D X-ray CT data, but I've presented it so it just shows what it would look like if you looked at it with your with your with your eyes. So we can see these pits forming on the surface, and this is after uh, a series of uh, polarization steps. But when we look a bit closer, remembering that the as-received material has got this very fine grain size of one micron and the heat-treated has got a 10 micron grain size, we start to see a number of differences as we like zoom in. And actually these uh, pits formed in the as-received material are very much um, sort of the hemispherical pits that uh, you might expect, but we see a much more complex uh, morphology of those pits in the heat-treated material where we actually see these like uh, quite detailed uh, sort of patterns representing the different phases of this uh, of this microstructure with we've got a ferrite and an austenite phase and this uh, duplex stainless when we take SEM images again one of the benefits of doing the x-ray CT is not only being able to see that at different stages of uh, growth of those pits but actually, because that's all done non-destructively, we can go in afterwards and do all of the same post-mortem examinations that, uh, that you, you might usually do. And so now if we look at um, the pits from the as-received material and the heat-treated, this is what it looks like from the top surface. So we can see we've got like a lacy cover on this pit. But once we've got ultrasonically cleaned that, we see it's actually just like a, sort of a smooth interior uh, hemispherical pit. But for the heat treated material, we see a very clear dissolution of the ferrite phase, which again we've confirmed with EDX of this uh, top surface to see where we've got nickel and chromium rich uh, phases. We can actually identify which bits have been dissolved very clearly. And again, you can see this complex morphology, which is really just now we've uh, identified as the dissolution of the ferrite. But it's interesting that We've got a similar shape of pit, but it's only only following the uh, the ferrite um, uh, dissolution through the microstructure. So, what was really uh, I was very pleased about in in this piece of work is that we tried lots of different ways of measuring the volume of those pits from different uh, techniques. So we used confocal and we used white light interferometry, but especially for these pits where you can see there's this really complex internal uh, geometry uh, morphology there's no way of doing that accurately from some of those surface techniques but with the x-ray uh, imaging we're able to compare the volume of the pit as predicted from um, faraday's law to the volume measured with x-ray ct and the biggest discrepancy we got was 2% difference in those volumes. Um, so it was really quite impressive. And none of the other techniques that we use from the top surface, which we wanted to try first because they're quicker and easier. But that uh, was a, a really good to see. The other thing is that actually understanding this uh, sort of morphology of these pits, we're able to compare the um, as received material to the heat treated material and actually understand a bit better some of the effects that must be taking place in that pit in terms of the diffusion um, in the pit where you've got this like complex internal uh, geometry. Okay, I'm going to go on to a different example and then I've got one more example um, I'm doing for time. Okay, so switching up to give another example of hopefully the power of uh, 3D imaging. This is a piece of work where we wanted to look at the um, characteristics of a PO coating. And actually, we had to, um, one of the, when we get a density map using X ray imaging, it, this is a challenging sample because the substrate is very high density titanium and the PO coating is alumina, which is relatively low density. And so actually in this uh, piece of work, we had to deposit the PO coating onto a thin foil of titanium rather than a bulk piece of titanium. So when we had 200 micron thick uh, piece of titanium, we can now get very good images of the uh, PO coating itself. And this is a 3D visualization from the CT data. And straight away, we can actually calculate here is the average thickness of that coating across this whole area which really amounts to 2,000 cross-sections with individual measurements. But now it's all done 
automatically in 3D. I mean, there's still a bit of processing that you have to sort of manually uh, sort of uh, keep an eye on. Um, but essentially, this automatic analysis now can give us a very accurate look at the coating thickness across this whole area. But what's more, we can actually use it to really highlight regions of interest. And there's various, various features of this coating that we were interested in to understand, uh, to understand its performance and the actual process of the deposition. So actually a number of these features where we've got these like uh, bulges and we've got these like what look like volcanoes with a big hole in the middle and then other re regions which are much more uniform thickness without any very strong features. So each of these we could sort of find and target with the, uh, with the 3D analysis for a closer look. So this is what we did after that CT scan to find these interesting regions. We went back into the SEM and we found those exact same locations. And once we'd found them, we cut them in half with the focused iron beam and then compared those features. This is the X-ray CT image. And this is the focused iron beam cross section of that same exact location. And here's another example where we found this big bulge. And actually, what does that look like in CT? And what does that look like in the FIB? And you'll see straight away that you add a lot of resolution and contrast. And you can see lots of things, especially these much finer pores, which just aren't visible in the CT image due to the, the, the lack of re resolution in that scan. But you can see straight away, we can identify certain features and understand actually how are they compromising the integrity of the coating because these different features some of them give a direct path it's as if there's no coating there at all in this location where we've got these volcano like features and actually some of these sort of uh, blister type uh, features these mounds are also in most cases completely undermined whereas otherwise they might look like regions of quite thick coating so again using the, the the 3d image from the x-ray ct we can look, we can quantify those the size of these pores and locate them and register them to the surface features that we can see in the SEM. And again, using this together is like a really powerful way of exploring these relevant uh, features. And so this is quite a nice uh, example of one of these volcano features that is just uh, located here, which doesn't look. Uh, I mean, you have to see it in 3D to really like uh, appreciate what it looks like. But it's this huge sort of like hourglass shaped uh, thing with actually there's, there's no coating between the environment and, and the substrate here. It's just a hole straight through it. So these these types of features are very detrimental to the uh, performance of the coating. But just seeing this morphology and how it's related to what is shown in the colors here is actually the original substrate and the depth. So the red shows a deep sort of trough where the, coat, the, the substrate has been eroded by, by the uh, deposition of the film. So again, we can see how those two things go together. OK, I'll move on to my uh, last example. So this is a, a, a continuous piece of work. I'll start with 5000 series aluminium and go on to 7000 series aluminium. Um, and in this piece of work, uh, we're looking at 5083, which is a, a marine um, alloy. And we're using slow strain rate testing. So this is where we have a round bar dog bone specimen and you strain it at a continuous rate until failure. Well, and in this case, we've observed it in situ using synchrotron X-rays down at Diamond Light Source. And we did two tests here. So this is in humid air, so it's about 70% relative humidity at room temperature and pulled at a strain rate of uh, four times five, uh, four, to yeah. the, four times 10 to the minus five per second. And we did two tests. The black curve here shows continuous strain rate to failure. So we just continue to strain at a constant rate until failure. And then with the other example, we get to just above yield and then we just fix the displacement and let it do what it wants to do at that point. So we've got these two different tests that, that we've uh, watched. And because we're 3D imaging continuously, we've actually collected 50 3D images during these, uh, during these uh, experiments. So if you could uh, play the video, please. Harry. And this is what we get. So here's the sample and here's the cracks. So coming in at a certain time step, we'll actually watch these cracks grow 
as a function of the straining and, and the time on test. So we can actually observe the velocity of these cracks, the location of the cracks, and actually straight away the different height, the sort of distribution of these cracks across the gauge length is already interesting in terms of how that compares to what you get on the final fracture surface, which I'll uh, go on to illustrate. But here we've now got a 4D data set where we've got time as well as the th uh, three dimensions. This is painstakingly how the information that we can extract. So with these two tests, a constant strain rate to failure and a fixed displacement, we can measure every single crack in that volume as a function of time. And you can see, no surprise, that with continuous straining, we have about an hour to failure of that specimen. And this is all of the individual cracks. There's about um, 40 uh, cracks in total in this specimen. And one thing you can see is that they've all got a slightly different life story. They start, some start very early, some start very late, some grow very quickly and slow down, some start slowly and then speed up. And we can look at each one of them to understand, well, why, why are those different things uh, happening to those different cracks? And we can plot a distribution of all of the cracks in the volume. And we can see which of those cracks lead to the final failure. But one thing that is interesting here is that actually you can see that in this constant strain rate, we've got a continuous initiation of these cracks and at the final time step, all of the cracks are still growing. When we compare that to the fixed displacement where we go up to above yield and then fix that displacement, we've essentially got a relaxation of the stress, but we're giving it a lot more time um, for the cracks to develop. And it's interesting, this is the point at which we fix that displacement, and you can see a number of cracks have initiated, and only a few initiate after this point, but there is a few that initiate. The other thing that is very interesting is the fact that a lot of cracks at this point just completely arrest and don't grow any further at all, whereas a number of the cracks continue to grow significantly. And actually, because we fix the stress and we don't continue to strain it, the total length of these cracks is up to one and a half millimetres before failure, whereas it's about 700 microns uh, in, in the uh, constant strain rate. And you can see the total time this takes, because we just fixed the displacement and let it fail, is more like uh, three to four hours uh, to failure in, in this example. But again, we can look at why does this crack grow so quickly at this point and why does this crack arrest at this point? And we can correlate that to the final failure. So this is the final time step just before failure. And we can correlate that to what we see on the fracture surface. And we can match up all of these cracks that have grown and see which of them contribute to the final failure of the specimen. I mean, straight away, you can see the difference in size of the cracks overall. And what is plotted on this graph is the size of the cracks and the time that they initiated. And the ones that are, are solid um, points are the ones that actually appear on the final fracture surface. And the ones that are empty, are the ones that have actually like in the volume gauge length and then haven't contributed to the final failure. And one of the main things that we're able to see is that actually it is some of the earliest to initiate cracks that grow to be the biggest and cause that final failure. Although there is this outlying point here, which has actually initiated quite early on and grown very large, but has not actually contributed to the final failure at all. And actually some further analysis that I've not um, presented here shows that this crack is directly above this crack. So it's actually shielded by, by the larger crack that uh, is uh, immediately uh, beneath it, which is this large crack two here. So again, we can correlate this to the post-mortem um, analysis and see how all of those, that whole life um, story of all of these cracks has contributed to this final failure. And what I would say about this, um, which I think is a, a useful thing uh, to know, is that if you stopped it at any particular time point, you'd be very hard pushed to guess which of those cracks were going to end up on the final fracture. And really, there's lots of things that can happen between the point that you observe it before failure and that final failure. So actually, 
it's always worth sort of trying to rewind in your mind and go back and think, actually, I know that this is the biggest crack now, but was it always the biggest crack? Does that explain something about what I'm seeing in, in, in the post-mortem investigations? So last thing I wanted to touch on was um, to just say something about um, how we've now added some different techniques. So this is in a similar vein of work. We're still looking at environmentally assisted uh, cracking of aluminium, but this time aerospace uh, alloys 7000 series and a slightly different test. But here, this is X-ray CT images of two different cracks in the 7050 and the 7085. Um, and the difference between these is we've got essentially much higher zinc content in these, uh, in this uh, 7085 alloy. But we see some quite different uh, behaviors. So the, what this shows is we've got a low resolution scan of this whole crack and then a high resolution scan of the crack tip. And we see some quite different behaviors just from the morphology of those macro scale cracks. And what we see is a much more rough crack for the 7050 and that actually leads to a lot more branching, although it doesn't diverge massively like you see in some steels. Um, we see a divergence in the crack, and all of these gaps here are actually solid metal ligaments holding the crack together, which don't really appear so much in this, uh, in this 7085 alloy. But we also see how this crack, all of these different colors show that these are all separate cracks propagating in parallel. And so, there's some different behavior. So what we did is we like now zoomed in to the crack tip of these two cracks and we did use the laser to create a very large volume of 3D EBSD data. So you can see the dimensions of this like 640 by 660 microns and it's got a one micron uh, cubic voxel size. So we can now plot all of the crystallography of those grains in, in that volume focused at that region right at the crack tip. And this is the crack within that volume. Um, and already there's a number of interesting things that we can see to relate the grains that we've uh, observed here to the splits and the branches in this, uh, in this crack. So we can get all of these different views and we look at it in different directions. And it's funny to look at a crack like when you section it almost on its plane because it sort of goes in and out of the view and the black is the crack here but we can relate that directly to this long uh, elongated pancake microstructure. One of the most surprising things for us was actually how the recrystallized grains in this material were really significant in terms of disrupting the path of the crack because the large pancake grains are deformed and elongated, whereas the recrystallized grains grow along the grain boundaries, but they also grow transversely. So they grow out of plane as well as along the di rolling direction. And actually this pink recrystallized grain here that you can notice because it's got a very flat orientation uh, color uh, compared to the sort of internal deformation that you see with the pancake grains is actually growing very tall in out of plane and actually becomes a complete barrier to the, the progress of the crack. So we can see that this split that we could see in the previous slide here is actually where it hits a recrystallized grain and is forced to go around it because it's actually not a flat pancake grain, it's actually grown out of plane, so it has to go around it. So I hope I've shown some examples of how 3D imaging can be very useful to get an insight and how we can add a time dimension by doing time-lapse imaging to really understand processes and how they evolve and that serial sectioning is also a very powerful technique, it's destructive, but using it in combination with X-ray imaging, you can zoom in to a region of interest and then just uh, get extra detail from that location. Okay, I'll finish there. <laughs>
you know, uh, were they arresting at grain boundaries? And secondly, um, there's been a lot of work on in the past on trying to correlate co uh, coalescence. I wondered if you had any comment on kind of the XY relationship uh, positioning of cracks in terms of coalescence. Yeah. Um, if I take the second part first, <clears throat> it's interesting that in these uh, in these materials, different from some other, say, like uh, pipeline steels, where you get like hundreds and hundreds of like initiating cracks, coalescence can be like a really significant factor uh, in, in those types of uh, materials and conditions that give you hundreds of uh, small cracks. But here we actually only have, say, tens of cracks and they're quite widely spaced. So actually we do see coalescence events and that definitely does accelerate those particular cracks. But within, you know, the 40 cracks that we would observed in one of those, we've got one case of coalescence. So it doesn't seem to be generally like a major effect in, in these materials. In terms of why those cracks arrest, it's obviously the slow strain rate test, you know, keeps on straining the material. So any roadblocks that these cracks see eventually can be overcome because you just apply more, more strain. And what we see is that when we stop that test and just fix that displacement, lots of those cracks have obviously met different types of microstructural obstacle and can't overcome them and they don't go any further. So I think it's interesting in terms of like what kind of conditions you'd get, say, in service, which might more typically be a, a sort of a fixed displacement rather than a continuous strain rate in terms of how relevant some of these uh, insights are to different applications. So does that give us an insight into a threshold for crack propagation then, do you think? Absolutely. So the work that we've followed up on here is looking at that threshold stress intensity factor and actually it's very close to the line of how big those cracks are, what is their stress intensity factor, and is it above that or below that threshold. But conversely, the interesting thing about that is that lots of the cracks are growing well below that threshold, which is not necessarily expected. Jack. Thanks, Tim. Um, just following up on the question um, you mentioned, you know, crack growth rates and so on, one point I was missing in your presentation is uh, image correlation, volume correlation, which is you know, like one of the techniques to really identify threshold displacements and so on. Can you comment on, have you tried to kind of correlate the different volumes or is it too difficult at the moment? Where are we with that? Yeah, basically um, some failed attempt because of how sort of fine and detailed I think I want to continue to look at that, but what we've seen is that we basically have to, we can't do it for the whole volume. We'd have to cut out one individual crack and then we can use like digital volume correlation, uh, uh, correlation to do that. Um, but I wanted, as soon as you add a bit of complexity about crack branching and all these things, it, 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 it already starts to struggle. But I think there's lots worth following up on there for sure. Yeah. Can I just pick up on one point that um, came out of your reply to Bob's talk? I was wondering if you have a crack meeting an obstacle and then it, it gets around the, the obstacle by shearing. Can you see that? Can you see an open shear, sorry, a, a shear crack that isn't really open? What's your resolution in terms of saying this is a crack, this is not metal? Yeah. Yeah, you can you can see that we've got some really nice examples of that. Actually, maybe it's uh, it, it's difficult to show here, but I mean you can see that between these different cracks at different heights, yeah. actually it is like a shear step that is connecting them to cause that final failure. And we do actually the final fracture is too fast for us to see, but actually there's some earlier steps where those cracks are connected through shear steps that you can you see. You still get the resolution to be able to see them. Yeah, although it is, it is the case that, you know, obviously we've got a resolution here, it's about two microns, so right. they have to be that wide, more or less, to be able to see them, and there's okay. definitely things that are smaller than that. So that's, yeah, that's quite a big crack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any further questions? No, thank you. Yeah, sorry. This time, I'm sure, Doug, I'm sure Doug is Tim, fantastic images. 
going back to your duplex example, if I understood right, there were three pits growing on the specimen and you had fantastic correlation by measuring the volume of metal lost and you correlated that with the electrochemical uh, volume that you would calculate. How did you know what the current was going to each individual pit to be able to calculate that? Luckily, Dirk is in the audience. He uh, can also uh, help with this question. Um, but what I've not shown here is that we've run several different cycles and we are, these pits do emerge at different stages. So a lot of the time you can actually, you actually can connect that to like one individual pit, but there would be lots of other times when actually they would completely overlap and that you, you would be struggling. Yeah. Thank you.